you came just to the edge of saying that the success of a moral entrepreneur could be somehow explained by their moral rightness. You, you said of Hunter that he had no way to account for the success of Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King because he disjoined their, their particular reforms of social norms from moral truth. Uh, you're, uh, all right, you're, you're shaking your head vigorously enough that I would just like to ask, what is it that you meant then by saying that, uh, what is it you think you can explain about their success that Posner cannot? And how is it that you think that their success teaches us anything about the reality or unreality of moral truth? Uh. I don't think anything could teach us anything about the reality or unmorality, unreality of moral truths. I don't, as Dewey said, reality is a term of value or choice. I'm in favor of truth, so if you like, I can say, yeah, moral truths are real, but it adds nothing whatever <laughs> to saying, I believe that the following are some moral truths. I, all I said about Posner and the moral entrepreneurs success was that he couldn't explain it by adaptation to a changed environment. And it seems to me that the careers of moral entrepreneurs show them show the environment changing because they did what they did rather than they're, they're adapting to previous causes. But I haven't got any explanation for their success. That is, I don't, I don't know why gay rights came along 20 years ago instead of 50 years ago. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was in you know society, in the economy, in whatnot that made it possible. I don't know why Galilean physics came along in the 17th century rather than the 14th century either. D does that speak to what you were asking? Um, do you think that from the fact of a moral entrepreneur's success we can infer something about their being as were moral rather than immoral entrepreneurs? That they've shifted, that, that the fact that the gay rights movement succeeded tells us that it was right that it succeeded. No, I, no more than the fact that the National Socialist Movement succeeded shows anything about them. You can never infer from success to rightness. You can never infer from anything straight to either truth or rightness. Uh, life would be simpler if we had criteria for truth and rightness other than entrepreneurship of the ma in the manner of Galileo and the gay rights movement, but we don't. That's the, that's the Shelleyan point about the imagination. Yeah. Doesn't your position imply that there is some kind of, I don't want to call it platonic ideal, but that there is some kind of better as opposed to a worse in morality, that it isn't just a question of contemporary habit. Well, I think before Plato lost things up by introducing the notion of objectivity into the area, we all thought that some moral judgments were true and others were false. We also thought Athenian society was better than Scythian society and so on. Plato then said, how come there can be true moral judgments. What makes them true? And we've been worried about that ever since. Dewey suggested we not worry about that anymore. <laughs> that we just go along with the common person in the street and say, yeah, there is truth and falsity in morals as elsewhere. And you would only think so if you were interested in praising some other area of culture as somehow superior to morality, like, for instance, theology or physics. Then, what is it that allows any kind of progress during all of that? Or what is it that allows people to say, this really is wrong, even if it was okay in the past? Is it just. I, I think. Where, what's the referent? If you ask what causes them to say that instead of what allows them to say that, the answer would be obvious. All the stuff that's happened in history between us and them. Uh, if you ask what allows them, 
you're already asking for an Archimedean point, rising above history and saying, you know, don't just tell me the causes, tell me the reasons, where reasons mean attaching to a skyhook that is immune from the contingencies of history. That's what Plato did for us. He, makes, he tempts us to ask for that kind of skyhook. And I see Dewey as doing his best to rid us from the impulse. It strikes me that pragmatism as a method may, well, to me it seems very similar to something like reflective, uh, reflective equilibrium as a method. And I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the relation between the two methods and whether that, if they are similar, that may cause Rawls to be a pragmatist, perhaps to find himself. I, I guess I, I never found much use for the notion of method, uh, either the method, either the pragma, pragmatic method or the method of equili reflective equilibrium. I mean, to, to say that Rawls practiced a method of equili reflective equilibrium is just to say, crudely, he, he balanced some of the theoretical statements and the philosophers against some, some of the intuitions of the people in the street and, you know, came out with something trying to do justice to both. Well, of course, he wasn't the first one to do that. Everybody has always done exactly that. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't see he picked out anything special when he talked about reflective equilibrium. And I don't think Dewey picked out anything special when he talked about the scientific method. My, my, one of my favorite passages in Dewey is when, when Carnap and the positivists asked him to write for the en Encyclopedia of Unified Science, an article on scientific method, he, he praised the chauffeur as an excellent paradigm of the scientific method. That was not what Carnap had in mind. <laughs> In a nutshell, my question would be, why aren't you, given all that you said this afternoon, indeed a metaphysical realist, but without any skepticism connected with it at all? What I mean is the following, that you said, and I, and I myself I think this is quite right, that in both, let's say, physics and in morals, we judge truth according to the standards at our disposal the standards that are in various ways marked by our place in history and time and place. And so we have only the standards at our disposal. You disagree with someone, the position you attributed to Richard Posner, when it comes to morals, someone who says, well, if we're only judging by our contemporary standards, how can we claim that what we're judging to be morally right really is morally right? You wanted to say, well, indeed, we can say it's morally right, precisely in the way in which when we judge questions about physical nature, we rely upon the standards at our disposal. And there's no reason why we shouldn't hesitate to say that the least that meet those standards that we now have at our disposal are indeed true. So why not say that in both models and in physics, the things that we judge by our present standards are indeed true, true, as you yourself said, timelessly so. The standards we use are bound up in our time and place, but the truths that we judge, be it in physics or in morals, are timelessly yeah. true. Yeah. And that looks like metaphysical realism, except that you don't want to be, a, you don't want to allow the particular version of metaphysical realism which says the following, truth is timeless. We have only our time-bound standards. So how could we ever claim that judging things by our time-bound standards gives us timeless truth? That's the kind of skeptical metaphysical realist that you, as we're associated with the title metaphysical realist. But I think you actually are, compliment you for being, I think you're right to be, a metaphysical realist in another sense, which is that you were quite willing to say, quite frankly, we use time-bound standards to judge what's timelessly true, be it in morals and for physics. Why isn't that metaphysical realism? I, I guess it does this, I mean, Putnam defined the term in such a way that the metaphysical realist had to be a skeptic. That he set him up in that way. Uh, so, I mean, you, it seems to me you're giving it a new sense. Uh, 
Well, he, if I could, I don't want to get involved in public philology, but when he did that, he did it by saying that truth as we actually should understand it, internal realism, is truth in something less than the timeless sense. That is, truth as judged by consensus or what would be assertable under ideal conditions or you know, all that sort of stuff, which is not what you really want to I never understood what Putnam meant by internal realism. He, he lately had said he didn't either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 